Thanks very much for that introduction and um, also Mareike and everybody else that has said these very kind words. I have to tell you that um, <laughs> sometimes this is not a choice. It is something that um, once you start working with turtles, they really grab you and um, you get sucked in and it is really, really, really um, a calling. And I'm hoping to share a little bit of that amazement with you tonight. And um, I'm going to go back in time, and I'm not going to give the standard conservation talk that I would normally give, which is very much shared with um, the work that Santosh and others are doing at Kaysen in Wildlife, but rather looking back into the very past history to try and sketch a little bit of an understanding in terms of what sea turtles are and why they are so special. And then quickly highlighting some of the complexities that we're throwing at them at the moment, and then probably try to make a forecast in terms of what we expect the future to be. Um, credit here to um, Grant Smith from Shark Life. This is not a picture that I took, but it is an absolutely spectacular picture of a leatherback male underwater just off Sordwana Bay. And this is also the beginning of the turtle season. So if you haven't got the turtles yet on your holiday plans, you should be, um, at the end of this talk, it should certainly be there. So when we, when we think about marine megafauna and conservation, we often think of these species, think, um, critters like whales. And I have to remind you that whales, are, of course, are mammals, and therefore they can regulate their own body temperature temperature, which allows them to pretty much go into any, any kind of temperature water, which means that they will go down to the Southern Ocean, into the Antarctic, and they can come back and um, up in the tropical waters of the um, East Coast. Or it's um, large, the long distances that the other marine um, megafauna, such as whale sharks or mantas, would swim. But they, of course, are fish. And the difference is, because they are fish, they can actually spend time at infinitum um, um, underwater. And these are two very important um, differences that I, have, uh, that I wanted to remember when we go through these, this presentation. When we talk about sea turtles, I have to remind you that they are actually reptiles. Now, reptiles, of course, are things that we see, on, um, see mostly on land. And um, there are very few marine reptiles. Here's a picture of a marine iguana, which is basically iguanas that's adapted to dive short distances or shallow distances into the sea. And we've got a few sea, uh, a few sea snakes, but it's really sea turtles, which are the only reptiles that have made it um, into the oceans and made a success of life in the oceans. And there are two things that you have to recognize that's really important in terms of their biology. The first thing is that they call blood call it cold-blooded um, simply, because they, their body core temperature is going to depend on what the environment is, which means that they are restricted in terms of the temperatures at which they can operate. They cannot go down to the southern oceans like marine mammals do. And unlike fish, they are air breathers, which means that they have to go down to the bottom to um, feed, but they always have to come up to the surface um, to breathe. And if they get, it, get caught in a net in between, they cannot survive there. So they are highly dependent on both the bottom and the surface, and that makes them vulnerable. Okay, of course, if you were as ignorant as I was when I started working with turtles, my uh, career started actually before I knew anything about turtles, and my knowledge was limited to what I saw in our absolutely beautiful aquarium that we have in the country. And most of the time we walk through the displays, you see a turtle and it's a cursory look without really, really appreciating what they are. We understand that they're pretty and that they're very special, but what are they? What, are, what is the ecology and um, why are they really so special? And as I said, if you haven't got it on your, on your holiday plans yet, then you should put it in there. 
because it's only when you see a turtle nesting on the beach that you really get sucked into this world. And it's almost like looking through a window into and back into time. And it's an absolute ancient ritual that's taking place. And it's really amazing to see the dexterity with which females are protecting their, their offspring. And um, this is the um, first leatherback that I saw. Now, you won't know how um, my size. I'm a very tall woman. I'm 1.85 meters, so six foot. And this little, so this is me sitting next to a turtle here. And this uh, female, her shell length alone was 1.83. So she is taller than what I am. So these are massive creatures. However, if we go back in time, they were much, much bigger. This is a picture of me sitting in the um, Natural History Museum in Vienna. And you can see I'm holding the head of um, a, a sea turtle skeleton here. And they were much, much bigger in size. In fact, if we look at what the um, ancient species were, were like, they were over four meters um, in size. A, good, a person would be the size of one, one of the flippers. And the largest of the turtles that we have now which are the leatherbacks sitting on the right-hand side in this picture, is very small by comparison to what we've had um, in the oceans in the past. So something has happened, and we're basically seeing this decline in size over time of sea turtles. And here we've got an example of a hard-shelled turtle. This is a loggerhead nesting on um, Isimangaliso beaches. And you can see that's a team of, of my students there, along with Santosh. And any one of us could easily re reach with our um, arms from side to side and measure that turtle. They generally just about one meter in length. The interesting part though is they are getting smaller. Just um, through the long-term monitoring program uh, with Ezumbelo, we've worked out that they decrease about a centimeter per decade. So loggerhead shells or turtles are getting smaller. And um, we don't have a very good explanation, and there are many um, much uh, debate in the literature. But there are three things that have been mentioned. The first one being climate change. So the explanation that's bantered around, and this is not only true for um, sea turtles, it's also the case for others, other species. And it is supposedly a thermodynamic ratio, surface area to body ratio. And as the seas are getting warmer, it is not uh, possible or optimal for them to be as large as they were before. Secondly is because we've had an impact on the oceans and uh, food distributions are changing, it becomes highly likely that they are food challenged, which means that they probably don't get the, the kind of nutrition in the time that they need it, and therefore they don't actually grow as fast as we would expect them to grow or as they would have in the past. And then lastly, one possibility is that they may mature earlier. In other words, reach sexual maturity and that they are actually younger when they come ashore. However, that's a very difficult aspect to test. I will um, come back to that um, one and I will, I will demonstrate why that is so difficult. But um, for the moment, we have these three hypotheses, but we can't really discriminate which one it is, or it could be a combination, of course, of all of them. So who are the modern sea turtles? Modern sea turtles, and I use the mod term modern here quite loosely, you can see that I'm talking about 120 million years ago is when we had the modern sea turtles, which is four different families that um, came about. Interestingly enough, two of those families are now gone extinct, the Toxokelidae and the Protostegidae, and it's only the hard-shelled turtles, that's how we know them as our child turtles, or the colony day um, that's around, as well as the Demokili day, which includes leatherback turtles. Um, and they're they called the leatherback turtle because of um, the, the body and what the, the covering is. It is a live skin that covers the back and it is not um, a dead tortoise shell like um, we see in other species. However, the um, leatherback is the only representative left in this family 
and they are currently critically endangered for the most part. So this is a species that needs particular atten conservation attention and um, is going to be the, the star of the show a few times tonight. This is also a species that in South Africa, we only have about 70 odd females per year that is nesting. So this is a very, very small population and we've, we've been looking after it well, but it actually um, is very, very sensitive. Okay, who are these critters that I have spent my time uh, looking at? So we're looking at the species that are present in the Southern African waters. So basically in Namibia or Angola, Southern Angola and Mozambique with the uh, East African or the islands um, of East Africa. As I've said, the biggest and only one in the family of um, the Demochilidae is the leatherback turtle. And this really is one of the most spectacular beasts I have ever seen. In this last season, I actually, things were just going wrong the one evening. Um, nothing was working and I sent everybody else back to the house and I just sat there watching this turtle nesting. And it reminded me again of what an absolutely ancient creature this is. It was under the moonlight on this very dark beach where you see this, um, or you can hear this breathing of this creature with tears streaming down the eye. Of course, it's not tears, it's just um, salt glands and making these very, very deep breathing sounds because it is such a hard work for them to come onto land because it's the first time that they really feel gravity. They're used to being floating light, lightly in the water, but when they come onto land, it is really, really hard work for them. The amazing bit is that they manage to grow to the size of um, what they do, nearly um, a ton, on jellyfish alone. That is the diet of a leatherback. Now it's a most bizarre, bizarre diet for a creature like that, but nevertheless they do very well in it. And of course, in this day and age where jellyfish um, seems to be increasing in the ocean, this is not a bad diet beyond there's plenty of food for them. The old faithful for the turtle monitoring program, of course, is the loggerhead turtle, the hard shelled. Um, turtles are the first of the hard shell turtles and um, they're only about a, a meter in size and the interesting thing about them is that they are carnivores and they're proper carnivores eating things like mussels and um and crabs and crayfish and all sorts um, that they scavenge off reef or off um, the sand and then a close cousin of loggerheads um, is the olive Ridley turtle. Now, olive ridleys in South African waters is quite scarce. In my entire career of 20 years, I've only come across four individuals in South African waters. So they, they're not abundant here, but there are many other places in the world where they are. And they, as I said, they're close cousins of, of loggerheads, which means that they have a similar diet. So they eat starfish and, and uh, crayfish fish if they have to or can for that matter, but they are carnivores and eating, meat, eating meaty things. But the more important or the more peculiar thing about um, Olive Ridley's is that they have a process called or a synchronized mass nesting called the Aripada. Now it's not all places in the world where they do this, but um, a couple of places like India and in Costa Rica, where turtle, the Olive Ridley's will accumulate um, in the surf zone off the beaches and they were just mill around, mill around, mill around and then on one particular night, which is not predictable, scientists have no idea why, the entire population will come out onto the beach and nest at the same time. There's a lot of speculation as to what the advantages of that is, but it is a really bizarre event and it's only the Olive Ridley and, and some of the camps that do this, but, um, and it's not all of the Ridley's um, all of the Ridley populations that are doing this either. Then we've got Hawksbill turtle with a very obvious reason why it's called Hawksbill is because of that very um, bird-shaped beak and it's using that to scrape um, sponges and cnidarians off the reef and anything else that's living in the reef um, underneath that. What's also interesting 
about hawksbills is that it's probably one of the most, more dangerous species to eat. Um, there are a couple of incidents um, reported where people that have eaten meat of um, hawksbills have actually died. And they think it is a combination of the spicules, which of course are the um, skeletal structure of sponges that gets incorporated into the flesh. And it could also be some of the toxins that we see in corals and sponges that get incorporated into the, into the flesh. And then lastly, what I call the cow of the ocean. Um, these are green turtles. <coughs> Excuse me, and they are called um, green turtles because the flesh can be green, but it's mostly because they are vegetarian. And they um, basically crop these different um, sea grasses and where, they are, where there's a high abundance of green turtles present, we actually get much higher diversity, species diversity of um, the background grasses because they maintain the very fast growing species. Of course, in South Africa, we don't really um, have <coughs> excuse me, I've got to follow my throat. Um, we don't have um, seagrass like um, the more benign waters of East Africa, but they do crop um, uh, algae off the reefs. So they are vegetarian almost exclusively. So if we look specifically at the beaches or in South African waters, <clears throat> we've got these two species, two groups or two, um, uh, what, what should we say, two um, behaviors really. Those being the migrants, like loggerheads and leatherbacks, that come onto our shores. They spend time mostly outside of our South African waters, but they come to our shores to nest during the summer months. On the other hand, we've got green turtles and hawksbills, which are here year round, but they don't actually breed in South Africa. They come from places as far as um, Seychelles, Madagascar, um, Comoros, even North um, East Africa, and the uh, juveniles use our reefs to grow out on all, um, and the adults grow and live on our reefs. So two different um, behaviors, those that are nesting and those that are resident on our reefs year round. Okay, so I've hinted at the life history. Let's, let's have a quick look at what we mean what I mean by the life history, and it's actually quite important in order to be able to understand what the conservation strategies are and why it is so difficult for us to um, protect sea turtles. It's not like um, anything on land where you can put them onto a reserve and you put a fence around it, or any of the other species where we can create a reserve and we have an expectation that they would stay there. Okay. The first thing we have to realize, and that's to our friend that was looking for turtle pictures. He doesn't have to go and find a turtle picture, a beach picture will do, because sea turtles go through a terrestrial phase in their life, which lasts for about two months as hatchlings. But um, of course, the females come ashore only for a few hours um, per night in the nesting season, and then they go back. And it's only in that few hours that they come onto the shore. We have to also realize that turtles come back always to breed from the beaches where they were born from, both males and females. And we refer to that as natal phylopatry. So coming home to, to um, stay and breed on the beaches where they grew up. They do this, of course, using magnetite in the brain and the Earth's magnetic fields that will guide them to more or less um, to the right beach or the vicinity. And once they're there, they probably use cues such as um, sound, knowing the reef, and smells like the cozy lake would be a very good smell for them to home back to. So they know that they are back to where they were born from. As I said, both males and females do this migration. And once they arrive on the nesting ground, we get promiscuous mating, especially if there's very high density of both males and females. 
and um, each female will mate multiple times, the males will then depart and go back to wherever their foraging ground is, but the females will stay and they will come ashore about six times, depending on the species, within a single season to lay um, a clutch of eggs. So each time that the female come ashore, she will lay about a, um, a 10 liter bucket full uh, um, of eggs. So every one of these nesting events is a huge amount of energy that she will deposit. Keeping in mind that while they are on the nesting grounds, they are away from their foraging areas and they don't tend to forage or eat while they are there. So this is all based on stored energy that they accumulated on the reefs where they um, come from. Depending on the species and the temperature, um, most of these uh, turtles will hatch after about 60 days. Um, the eggs will hatch and the hatchlings will take about five days. It's not immediate. Once they come out of the eggs, it will take them about five days to work their way to the surface where they will sit under the sand and wait for the temperature um, at nightfall to give them the cue that it's getting colder and that it's under the darkness that they can come out. But this five day synchronized digging that they do together is also a time of development for them. So there's a lot of development that happens um, like the egg sac would close and the lungs will develop because once they come out of the water, they have to do a sprint down the beach to make it onto the reef. And once they enter the water, it becomes a two-day frenzy where they will just sprint across trying to get away from the reef and get to the nearest current, which will then distribute them. But we don't have a very good idea where they then go to, and we refer to this as the lost years. And these lost years, I'm going to come back to this. Um, we have learned a little bit by now um, in South Africa about it through um, some modeling that we've done. But uh, um, lost years is something that we all want to study. And then after about a decade, these um, juveniles will come back and live on the reefs like in Ismangaliso or Aliwal Shoal until they are um, old enough to start their own migration uh, or reproduction. So if we put all of this together, um, we will get a graph and don't worry, there are not many graphs in, in this presentation, but this is quite an illustrative one. And I'm sure you've heard it many times when people refer to sea, sea turtle um, surviving or survivorship as one in a thousand. And it basically means out of these um, thousand hatchlings that may be produced um, each season, only one female will eventually come back to breed. And if you think about it, they lay about 500 um, eggs within a season. It means that each female will need, need to breed at least two seasons before she replaces herself. Okay, so let's look at the population numbers. In South Africa, we have roughly a, about a thousand loggerhead um, females nesting per year, which means that if they come ashore, they produce about 500,000 eggs. Now that sounds like great news, but of course, not all of them survive. Um, this, the eggs in the sand um, unfortunately get, gets exposed and dug up by a whole bunch of predators, of which the most um, common one in our South African shores, of course, being ghost crabs. They can dig into the nest and the moment that they um, detect an egg, they will break it. And then we get ants into the nest. There's a huge amount of fungi. And we, we get iguanas, honey badgers, mong, water mongoose. So predation, natural predation on eggs is actually very high. That, however, is not a bad thing in a well-managed system like we have in South Africa, because it's a lot of the nutrients that are being released of a very um, nutrient-poor coast. So these nutrients are then made available to the likes of ghost crabs and these other animals, and of course, also terrestrial and plants, which will be fueling the ecosystem. For those hatchlings that do make it into the shore, uh, across the shore, they are going to be fed on by fish, whether it's reef fish or later open water fish, and um, they just get slurped up, slurped up and the mortality of these little hatchlings 
the place tattling is very, very high until they actually get big enough where they can outgrow most of these predators up to the point where they are at adulthood, which um, only the largest of the predators, like the large sharks, will still be feeding on them. So what we see here is out of these thousands of eggs, only one of the females will actually mature, or very few of them will mature, and they are then responsible to maintain the population. So I'll come, I'm going to come back to this graph again because it is an important one to understand um, conservation. Okay, talking about the lost years and reminding ourselves it's that sea turtles are reptiles and therefore they are dependent on the environment um, for much of their biology and ecology, which means temperature is really important to determine where they can nest and how where they can operate even as hatchlings. And then the currents will be dispersing or de determining where they would go to. So this little star here is the South African um, nesting beaches of which is probably one of the, it is the southernmost, in other words, the coldest nesting beach in the world. But it is um, partly made possible by the Agolas current that is extending down. So when we look at hawksbills and green turtles, they can only nest on the warmer beaches, which is um, adjacent to the red that we see here. So strictly speaking, above 28 degrees Celsius, and higher, whereas loggerheads and green uh, loggerheads and leatherbacks are actually more temperate nesters, so they can nest a little bit further south. If we look at where they go to once they enter the water, so once they've done the scramble down the beach and they hit the, the shore, they can swim out for two days and then they get into the current, we get this very confusing graph on the left-hand side, but let me explain, it's not that difficult. So the dark spot that you see um, there would be the um, nesting beach. And when the hatchlings go into the water, this is just the dispersal for the first year of their life. And you can see leatherback hatchlings will be three quarters of their way, could be three quarters of their way to Australia or way past uh, Angola on the, on the Benguela. So they literally within a year can go anywhere and these speckles that you see down to the south, which is not a stripe or a track attached to them, those are hatchlings that we predict would have ended up in the Southern Ocean, which just if, um, to remind you on the right-hand side, this is the, the below this current area where the water gets a bit blue. In other words, it's really cold Arctic Southern Ocean water below 12 degrees. And we predict that hatchlings would actually, they. Uh, once they get into that water, they will not survive because it's too cold and they will not get enough food. So out of those thousand hatchlings or tens, tens of thousand hatchlings that enter the water, a very large proportion of them ride with the current, but then they actually die because they don't um, survive the, the temperatures um, of the, of the, um, along the Cape Coast. The animals are different. And we can we know exactly where they go to. We don't have to predict using um, oceanographic models. We can simply put a satellite tag, and we have put um, satellite tags on. And these are the the tracks that we've seen. The top ones are the ones for from the last season, the most recent ones, so thirteen animals, and the bottom one are all the other ones that we've tracked so far. So we are looking at. Um, leatherbacks that can either stay on the coast, they go north into the Mozambique Channel, or they literally can go into the um, Indian Ocean or into the Atlantic, wherever there is good food for them and it is warm enough for them to stay. And these are actually the foraging grounds of adult leatherbacks. They don't go onto a, onto a reef or anything, they basically stay in the open ocean. Now, this is new. I don't think I'm um, Santosh and um, my students even have seen this. These are um, models that we predict will, um, where the hatchlings of both hawksbills and green turtles will go to if they hatch from Aldabra. Aldabra, of course, is a very uh, famous world heritage site, and both of these species do nest there. And interestingly enough, 
because they're on the uh, equator and they, the dispersal basically hit the African continent, they can go both north and south. And what, of course, in this case, I'm particularly interested in those going south in the, um, into the Mozambique Channel and around our coast. So out of these tracks, you can see that a very large proportion of hawksbills and green turtles nesting on Aldabra. So even though they don't, even though they don't live in our waters, the hatchlings do disperse in our waters, and eventually they do settle on our reefs. And because of this um, dispersal, along with loggerheads and featherbacks, we've actually managed to expand the marine protected area network in South Africa. And all of these reefs that, that you can see along the east coast of Africa and along the Agulhas Bank are absolutely critical habitat, adult and juvenile um, sea turtles, both of those nesting in our waters and outside of our waters. So this is really something that South Africa, not only the monitoring program that we've done right, but this is really a feather in our cap in terms of protecting sea turtles at sea. Okay, why do we need to protect turtles? Of course, as I've explained um, the biodiversity value, in other words, um, how they contribute to the ecosystems and to reefs. But this has not been the case historically. Historically, they were very, very important in the ancient cultures. The um, Australian Aboriginal people talk about the great mother turtle that's guiding the hatchlings home. And they still have traditional hunting rights because it is so integral to their culture. There are some of the um, uh, tribes in Madagascar that still have the traditional right to hunt um, turtles. And it's basically because they're good fortune, they believe that they're good fortune, depends on it or not. The Iroquois people of North America has got a story that tell that they tell about um, the world uh, being created on the back of a sea turtle. And there are many other cultures where um, there are amulets of some kind with a turtle um, souvenir because it is so important into their uh, so important and creature in the cultural values. South Africa is interesting because we don't have that very strong um, history or currently, um, at least not what we could ascertain so far. And as far as I've worked out, most or many of the people, local indigenous people, are quite scared of sea turtles because they believe that, uh, or they get threatened by their parents that um that if you if you do naughty things the turtle will take you away so people are not comfortable necessarily to go on to the beaches at night and witness um turtle nesting um in the past it was not only the socio-cultural value but economic value the ancient greeks started with um coining their money with if it had a turtle it was worth more than for instance if it had a star so it was used as a discrimination um, in terms of currency, or simply using tortoise shell, a shell plate. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I've got a tortoise, a green turtle shell in my hand. And this was money of the days gone by. So you basically use a shell plate as the equivalent um, of whatever the currency was and pay with that because it is so incredibly valuable. And more recently, we're talking about the, in the era of the seafarers, of course, for them, it was incredibly valuable because they could go and find fresh meat and fresh eggs, either by fishing turtles out of the water or going onto any beach and collecting turtles, put them on the um, uh, deck of the ship <coughs> and just simply take it with. And for months, the turtles will stay there and not, and not um, need to be fed. And um, whenever they, whenever the seafarers needed fresh uh, meat, they would slaughter a turtle and they didn't need to re refrigerate it. And the same with eggs. They knew where on which islands predictably they could go, which times of the year to go and get um, turtle, turtle meat or turtle uh, eggs to take on their journeys. <coughs> The best part, of course, after you've eaten your food, 
is the package or the wrapping that it came in, in this case, the shell, was also very valuable. And then when they landed wherever they um, were going to trade, <coughs> they actually traded the turtle shell. And we can see all the very nice products that were made out of Beko or turtle shell. And that was um, a status symbol if you owned that. Of course, these days, these are like ascites listed species. So when you travel overseas, please do not buy a turtle product. Even if it is in Mozambique, you cannot bring it or you cannot legally bring it into the country because it actually caused turtles to go or to be threatened because of the scale at which hunting was taking place. And if you think South Africa or that this was only happening elsewhere, it's not the case. Our very good colonial history was probably the start of um, the turtle harvesting in South Africa. There might have been indigenous harvesting in the north as well, but certainly the colonial harvesting um, started here. And in the book by um, Daphne Childs, which was about uh, Sidney Turner, he was uh, the portrait of a pioneer. He wrote this piece. This of the picture in the background is a Mzumukulu River. Um, in Lower Kuzulu in Macau. And in the 1860s, already he wrote this. It says, we get lots of turtles here in the net. We caught two large ones the other night, the last, largest weighing in as near as we could guess, five centiweight, that being about 500 pounds. It took five of us to roll him up onto the boat. They are extraordinarily tough. They lie here in the garden, sometimes a month on their backs without food or water and seem to take no harm. So by then, people were already harvesting turtles, green turtles, by all um, likelihood, in the estuaries of um, Lower Quazulu Natal. And it was the first introduction of conservation measures in the region came actually from Seychelles. We are very proud of our history in South Africa, but the first conservation measures were introduced um, in Seychelles around 1925. And this was James Ornell, which was commissioned to do a report on the turtle fishery at the time and make recommendations in how conservation should take place. And he wrote that uh, so important to the general community is the insurance of the continued prosperity of these fisheries that this subject has for long been a source of anxiety to the government. Because there were so many people um, dependent on sea turtle and sea turtle resources, it is something that the government at the time felt that they needed to maintain. And in order to maintain it, they needed to put restrictions and regulations in. So in um, 1925, the turtles ordinance was introduced, and they have, amongst other things, two important regulations that I want to highlight. The first one being the capture and sale of undersized turtles are forbidden under the penalty. A minimum size for hawk turtles is a length of 24 inches and um, down the middle, and that for green turtles is about 30 um, inches, and the eggs of the species may not be removed. Okay, so you couldn't capture small turtles, only large ones, and you were not allowed to remove eggs. What that means is the hawk's bills could only be harvested from about seven, uh, 60 centimeters onwards. And keep in mind that they reach sexual maturity only at about 80 centimeters. And green turtles at about 76, they reach maturity at about 100 centimeters. It means that these were only subadult and adult sea turtles that were harvested. Now, I think if it is not um, clear to you, but I think it should be clear to you that this is probably very unsustainable kind of harvesting because what we're doing here is saying that you can only catch large turtles and many of these are actually nesting females, those that are ready with eggs. Once you've actually caught them, you can take these eggs and go and bury them. But for instance, look at the picture on the bottom left. This is an indigenous harvesting in Sri Lanka um, of Olive Ridley. You can see the white shells on the one turtle. Those, that's the first one. 
that's ready to be laid. But all of the other ones where they're yellow have not yet been shelled. So whatever you do, those eggs are never, ever going to be viable. So even at best, you can get one clutch of eggs out of this um, turtle, and that's it. It might not have ever bred in its life. And um, unfortunately, we do have some poaching incidents on the um, on South African waters. That's on the right-hand side. And that is also of adult female turtles. But Ezembelo is incredibly good on the ground and chase um, after the poachers. And we have very, very few incidents every year because it is really important to protect these adult females. Why? I want to go back to this graph. And you will... Um, see why I'm saying so. If we have this one in a thousand kind of approach and you introduce fisheries regulations at the right hand end of the spectrum, we're basically saying that turtles have lived their entire life, survived or get to an age refugee, a refuge where they are large enough to not be eaten. And now we introduce a size where we can start to harvest them as people. So if you take out these three um, sub-adult and adult turtles on the right-hand side, I think anybody can see that this pyramid on the left is going to collapse entirely. So this strategy, this harvesting strategy for sea turtles is just absolutely wrong. And there are places where there are alternative um, measures being considered, particularly the Turks and Caicos Islands, where they are now introduced some of the and no adult turtles are allowed to uh, are allowed to be captured, or even um, or even um, sub adult turtles. Okay, so South Africa's conservation, we have been the pioneers in it. We started ne um, pr protecting nests in 1963, and when I say pioneers, it's not only because we've been doing it so long. We were the first people to protect leatherbacks in the world, the second people to protect loggerheads in the world. There was no handbook how to do this. And it's by trial and error of the old parks board that um, we learned how to do this and how the rest of the world learned from us how to protect turtles. I don't want to talk about the um, population history and successes, but it is just important to realize that these um, nesting beaches at the time were not protected. It was realized that um, these are really important for um, these two species, loggerheads and leatherbacks. And through several conservation measures, almost one significant one every decade, we got to the point of the World Heritage Site, the Ismangaliso Wetland Park, which is on the east coast of Africa, um, bordering with Mozambique. And um, in 2019, is expanded to about 20, 30 kilometers out um, at sea. So it is one of the largest marine protected areas that we have um, around, well, it is the largest in our, uh, along our shores, but one of the largest in the world. And it is directly a cause of sea turtles um, nesting in our shores as well as those um, living on the reefs. This area from Sordwana Bay North, I saw that Peter Jacobs is also in the audience. Peter has got a concession, he's a drive concession, but he reports um, and records uh, turtle nesting on our behalf um, from Sordwana Bay North. And then from the Manzanguenya area, we have um, monitors that walk, um, for the, actually we've got monitors walking all the way from Sordwana to the cozy lake area. Now, these are the real heroes of the conservation program. Every season, about 40 odd monitors are trained by Santosh and um, trained how to do turtle monitoring. And they will um, then walk the beaches twice around the world per season to record and protect turtles. And what we have seen is that this has been. Um, exceptionally successful, particularly for loggerheads. So this is where I joined the stars here. And you can see, lucky, that these numbers of loggerheads have increased, but so not so much for leatherbacks. And we don't know why this is the case. It is something um, that I've spent my career trying to establish, but um, that is not the, the discussion for today. 
but it will just suffice to say that they haven't increased, but they have remained stable over this time. One thing that I do want to um, go back to is one of the endeavors that the Parks Board did do was in the year when I was born in 1972, they started notching turtles. And it's basically using a mutilation tag to um, put a, a notch on the carapace shell and then um, with a particular year code. And over time, they notched more than 300,000 um, hatchlings and they could only do that for loggerheads. And George retired after 30 years with very few of these individuals coming back. And in my career, in Santos's career, we have now seen these individuals coming back. And through this fantastic initiative, we've learned that it takes about 36 years for turtles to grow from adulthood, uh, from juvenile um, to adulthood of the hard child turtles. So it takes an enormously long time before they come back. Sea turtles are incredibly well adapted to a life at sea and um, feeding on jellyfish, particularly leatherbacks. So if you look down the throat of a leatherback, you will see these thorns. And these thorns are there basically if they bite into a jellyfish, you will see the, um, that they can ingest it and they can expel some of the water without losing what they just bit into, which is really good because they, they can never spit out um, with the water that they ingest. The problem with that is plastic. It means that once they mistakenly bite into plastic instead of a jellyfish, they cannot spit it out. It has to go through the gut. And the problem with that, of course, is that it causes huge amount of obstruction. If it's lucky, it will just pass through, but it doesn't always happen. And the folks at um, Two Oceans Aquarium particularly have done some work and the hatchlings are unfortunately vulnerable to the same, especially if they eat hard plastics, it um, punctures the gut, and they see um, hundreds of hatchlings every year washing up on them in Cape Town because they are sick or injured um, because of plastic in the intestine. Okay, one last point that uh, um, theme that I want to talk um, about when we think about uh, reproduction, we tend to always default to mammals. So male, female, which is determined by um, genes. But if you go into the sea or into um, water aquatic systems, it doesn't always work like that. So how many of you, for instance, have ever seen a large or a small blue parrotfish or a large pink parrotfish? It is not the case. They basically have a phenotypic and a genotypic sex. They start off as, as female when they are young, and as they grow older, they go um, turn into males, and they are. They turn into blue, very stereotypical. Or you have um, species like red roman, which has got a harem system. The largest um, individual will always be the male. If that big male is either um, eaten or um, caught off a reef, the largest female will change sex without changing the genetics, but it will change sex to become the dominant female. So in um, marine species, the genotype and phenotype, or what the individual is, is not necessarily correlated. In reptiles, it can even be more complicated. We can have systems where it is the um, terrestrial uh, sorry, where the, where the temperature of the environment determines what the gender is going to be, or the or genes, and sometimes the same species can have both systems operating in different places. So it really, really becomes complex. And in the case of sea turtles, it's also the environment, more specifically the incubation temperature in the sand, that determines whether they are going to be boys or girls which is similar to, red, uh, to crocodiles, but it is the other way around. So basically, if the sand temperature is cool, so less than um, 29 degrees, more or less, we get majority boys being born. And if the sand temperature is very hot, it is majority um, girls being born. I always say chicks are hot and the boys are cool. And um, 
somewhere in between, we've got the 50-50 sex ratio, which is in most populations, the ideal where we want to be. So 50-50 sex ratio more or less at 29 degrees. That's an ideal world for sea turtles. So we have monitored this over time. And uh, that basically means every time that a, a female will lay a clutch, we will put a temperature logger in and then follow it during the season. And when we think that clutch is ready, we will put a net over it to catch the hatchlings. I have to tell you that there is no way that you can look at sea turtles, youngsters, and say whether it's a boy or a girl. There are people that come up with all sorts of references, but there is nothing on the outside or externally that will tell you what it is. There are some um, different methods now which will guide us, but genetics does not tell you what it is because it's entirely the, the incubation environment that um, dictates whether it's a boy or a girl. So we have to use these eye buttons to monitor nest temperature, and then through some tricky um, reconstruction, work out what we had. And this was the um, sex ratio of the nests that we monitored in the last season for leatherbacks specifically. And if you look at the ideal sex ratio of 50-50, then you can see all of the nests that we monitor, way overproduced male um, turtles and not female. It was only one of the clutches that was laid um, much later in the season where we started to get female production. And if we look at the history of this um, rookery over time, then um, we can see that um, this is basically what we got from the South African Weather Service. And yes, global warming is happening even on these beaches. There's a, an upward trend, um, which means that we will produce more females over time. But interestingly enough, we get this um, fluctuation over time. So it is not as simple to say, yes, the temperature is increasing. Some decades are cooler than others and warmer than others. So we really have to have much more frequent monitoring to say where we are. And this last season that we had, the 2021-22 season, was significantly cooler than anything that we've had in the past. So these um, male bias nests that we've had in the last season are probably atypical but it does contribute to maintaining a maintaining balanced sex ratio within the population. Okay, so where to from here? This is my um, third last slide. Sea turtles are incredibly well adapted to the environment. They've been around for a very long time, and even though they are peculiar reptiles and marine systems, they are really well adapted to those systems. As people, we've been foolish. We've tried to manage sea turtles, not often to the best um, of what they what they need, but um, and we've over harvested them. So the jury is very much out, especially with um, climate change being a reality, the habitat destruction that we've caused, and the way that we've boxed these um, large migratory species in. So we really are um, at the mercy of what we can do, but what the environment is going to do and how adaptable the variability within these species in terms of what we're going to see in the future. And of course, they are also the heroes that are out there monitoring, but also my students every year and all of the other people that are out there collecting data to, that help us to inform what this all means for um, sea turtle monitoring and for sea turtle populations. And then I think, um, one very important contribution that you can make. People always want to get um, to be part of the turtle or part of turtle monitoring. But one of the initiatives that we've started is to, to develop a citizen science program. And that is every time that you see a turtle, it doesn't matter whether it's on a reef or whether, whether it's washed up, we want to know where and where and when it is and who it is and how big it is. You can go to our new website. It's not yet launched. It should be um, ready by next week. I looked at it, the draft today. It will be www.turtlesa.org. And all turtle, all issues around turtles in South Africa will be um, logged on there. So anything that you need to know, you're going to find there, including how you can contribute data to our new citizen science program. So basically, it's up to us. To, to decide what the future of sea turtles 
are going to be, and it really is the um, the next generation that's really dependent on it. But we have to make uh, an effort for young and young and old to make sure that they are going to be around for another 120 million years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Now, I've learned so much in this past hour. Um, so I know that you might have load shedding in a bit, so I'm going to just speed up here and ask if there are any questions. So we might possibly squeeze in a few. Okay, Leslie Cornish. I was wondering if the eggs could be moved to more suitable beaches, if there are any, whether that might work or there might not be any beaches um, to go to. In South Africa, we are lucky because we have got such beautiful beaches and there's basically from Richards Bay, well, Cape Vida all the way to Cape Town, where we will theoretically be able to move it. But um, we don't need to move turtle eggs yet. What we do have to remember though is turtle eggs are incredibly sensitive to, to moving. You can only move it within the first six hours after it's been laid because the eggs need to imprint on the environment or imprint magnetite and the embryo um, yeah. actually, the embryo actually settles in the egg and the moment that it start uh, that you move it it actually bleeds to death so wow. you cannot move eggs more than six hours after laying yeah. and ca can i ask some more questions please yeah, yes sure. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Are males also um, sight faithful? Yes, both so, males so, and females. Yeah. yeah. So, of so course. the populations on a given beach wouldn't necessarily mix. And then I've seen some photographs of um, uh, turtles in the Pacific that have got some horrible growths on them. And none of the photographs shown here had those growths. Um, is that because they don't have them so much or is it just lucky those particular pe um, pictures? Thanks, now I've finished. Sure. Um, with regards to uh, the male fidelity, of course they, they do have um, natal phylopatria and homing like the females, like the females do, but um, like most males, they would like the opportunity to breed. So if they come across a female that's receptive, they will breed with it um, en route to the nesting ground. But they also, so we end, essentially end up with closed genetic populations for the most part in sea turtles. So the turtles that we have in South Africa are only South African turtles, essentially. With regards to these growths, um, I think the folks from the aquaria could jump in here. But um, most of the times those horrible tumors are what we call fibropapillomatosis or turtle cancer. And we um, are not entirely sure of, the, of all of the triggers, but most of the time it is very poor water quality that makes turtles susceptible to this virus that's, that's causing these tumors. And because, um, our waters, when I say our waters, and including the whole of the Western Indian Ocean, we actually don't have such industrialized um, uh, uh, cities. So we don't have the kind of runoff and disturbances in the water as they would have in, in more uh, first world nations. And because of that, we don't have that prevalence. However, we have had incidents of, of uh, green green turtles particularly, they're very susceptible. They're not so hardy like loggerheads, but we've had um, incidents of fibropapillomatosis. Um, I think two or three cases confirmed now in South African waters um, where they do um, display those tumors. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I see Mareka said she's only um, seen one stranded individual. And um, we have, we've had actually individuals in the, in the Aquaria now um, confirmed fibropapillomatosis. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Nell, and thank you, Leslie, for the question. Um, Marty, Professor Nell, you were, 
you were out because of the load shedding, but I want you to see Marty's picture. He... <laughs> I love terrapins. Well I love the terrapin, so it's not as good as uh, a, a turtle, but yeah, thanks very much, Prof. Uh, it was a very, very interesting talk. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, as you mentioned, the hawk's bill is very obvious how it gets its name. I'm interested how the loggerhead gets its name, because if I look at it, I'm a bit, what, what does it mean? Uh, why, why is it called the loggerhead? So that's the sort of first question, if you don't mind. Um, I am not entirely sure where it gets its name from, but my understanding has been is because it is such. If you if you com compare the head size of a loggerhead turtle relative to the others, the head is uh, materially larger relative to the body, and part of that is because it's got really really strong jaws because they can bite through um, shells and um, things like dog whelks and things. So they they really are um, a stubborn head, really, and um, that that's been my interpretation of a logger head because they have a, a very large, heavy head. Okay, so like the hyenas of the ocean. Pretty much, pretty much, okay. except that they're not scavenging, but they are predators. But yeah, very much. And then I'm just interested. I mean, of the I think there were five or six species. There's only one that has. If I can call it, you know, the leatherback, as far as I understand, and again, I'm not that uh, knowledgeable mm -hmm. about turtles, but it's still got a bony um, carapace underneath the skin. So why the the different um, uh, uh, strategy, for want of a better word, um, it, it's almost like a plastic bag of skin outside the shell, whereas the other ones have got a shell on the outside. And does it make it actually more successful? than the other species i'm just interested um <clears throat> i mean that's, like if, if that skin gets damaged are they like done for or is it actually like a double layer of protection it's a really smart question by the way um leather backs leather backs are have a bony skeleton and the shell of a turtle is basically the ribs that's forming that that body shape but over the ribs we have, instead of bone, we have a series of shell plates that's no bigger than your thumbnail that's stitched together, and that is all cartilage. So if you lean against the shell of a leatherback, it collapses, it um, contracts and expands, and um, in, it makes it um, quite strange to work with. But that is a really, 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 really good strategy if you want to dive one and a half kilometers deep. And that's the difference why they are so good. Because most of the other turtles have got an operational depth of between the surface and about 200 meters, um, apart from the fact that they are smaller. So leatherbacks can dive much deeper so their bodies get compressed a lot more. But they have another peculiarity about them that's not only based on the shell and this live skin over it. Um, that live skin, by the way, means that there is hardly ever any fouling growing on it. So because the skin is oily, you won't see these very large um, barnacles, for instance, they were getting on. Yes, there are barnacles, but they're hardly ever bigger than your pinky nail because they just get shed so quickly. So very good in self-cleaning, especially if you've got these ridges that's um, very streamlined. And then the other thing about leatherbacks is that, that they are similar to the Komodo dragons, they actually are um, warm-blooded. They have they maintain the uh, the body heat, unlike the other um, sea turtles. And it's one of the one of the adaptations that allow them to dive so deep. And um, they are highly vascularized, so their metabolism is very different to the other hard-shelled turtles, and which is one of the reasons why it's in a family of their own. Um, really good evolutionary strategy but not good with the kind of threats that we've thrown at it um, in the contemporary world. And those old dinosaur um, turtles, the ones that were like, you know, even I think five times or eight times bigger than the, the current one, was that a soft shelled or was it a um, hard shelled, like a green turtle? Um, from the um, information that we've had from the fossil 
accord is much more similar to the hard shell turtles. And um, there are not many that have the design that we have in the leatherbacks currently. Okay. No, thanks. That's, um, yeah, it was, it was great, uh, your, the talk. Uh, I think there was one other that I'd noted down. Oh, those, those spikes down their throat were absolutely amazing. Is that just the leatherback or all turtles? No, um, as the, the other ones are much smaller and it is not really um, part of their, or part of their anatomy. It's much, much, much more pronounced in leatherbacks. Um, leatherbacks start, or all turtles start, they lie feeding on jellyfish um, and floating things, but then um, leatherbacks maintain that, whereas the other turtles change to, um, to other things. So it's not, it's not as obvious in other species. And then do turtles have like normal blood? I mean, or, or do they actually have blood like a normal creature? <laughs> or... Yeah, but unlike, they, they've got um, nucleated blood. So they red blood cells, for instance, have got nuclei, which is really great for us. So when we take blood, we can actually use that to get nice DNA out of it. Um, but yes, it's nice red blood. like, uh, And it's really hard to get blood out of a leather bag, by the way. We've um, struggled. Most of the time, people will get it out of the um, cervical sinus, just um, behind the head. But because they are so large, you basically have to use an epidural needle. And I'm not prepared to do that while the, fe while the um, nest female is nesting. So we tried from a, 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 the reed system in the um, back flipper, but it's not as vascularized. So it's really, really hard. And a lot of swear words. <laughs> and that skin that goes over the shell, that doesn't, I mean, it's not like if you cut it, it won't bleed per se. Um, over the shell, yes, it does, but it's really thin. So the um, it's really funny the first time when we, because of part of our instructions um, and interest, of course, is to bring a veterinarian with. And because most of the veterinarians, I hope our vet is still here, do, uh, um, do not work with them in the lab because um, leatherbacks do not well do not do well in captivity at all. So we know virtually nothing about them. And the vet brought a syringe and she went in and it's only about a millimeter thick and then you hit shell. So um, those sea turtles actually get hammered very heavily. So um, I first worked with a turtle of which about a, um, a third of the back was taken off with what I think was a boat strike. So a big ship propeller that basically just terminated the back. And a few seasons later, she was back there nesting um, yeah, they're, they're really, really tough. Thanks very much. It's very interesting. Sure. Sure. No worries. Have you, have you seen a turtle nesting before? I haven't. It's uh, on one of my to-do lists. <laughs> it should be, definitely be on your bucket list. And there are some, some colleagues here that can take you there. Thanks, man. Sure. No worries. Thank you, Marty. Um, so, Professor Nell, when is the... When can we go? Like during which part of the year? Now, um, the turtle turtle monitoring or turtle nesting is, is strictly speaking starting in a week, but um, it's a very slow start. So the peak nesting is somewhere from the beginning of December until about the first week of January for both species in South African waters. And if you go by the middle of January, you've got a good chance of seeing both females and hatchlings. So if you really want to see hatchlings, that would be the time to go. But so, yes. And that's on the, the, the place that it stays it in. Um, it oh, has to be in Isimangaliso Park. The, you can go, there are um, three places. You can go from Cape Vidal. I'm not sure if Santos is still here, whether um, some of the concessions are allocated to um, Cape Vidal, but definitely Sotwana. You can join Ufudu Tours. That's one of the... Um, operators, as well as walk-on concessions, or there's also at um, Mabibi and um, at Banga Neck, you can pay the local community and they've got a walk-on tour and uh, visit turtles there. So at least four places in the park where you can join a high-end, low-end um, tour and go and see turtles. And that information's on the website? 
It will be. Let's launch trip. It will be. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, so Adrian Ovelhauser is going to Sedwana Bay on the twenty third December till the first of January. What would be his choices? What would be his choices or his chances? Chances. Sorry. <laughs> I, it, chances. His, his chances are good to brilliant. Um. Yeah. Um, if you're there for more than that, yeah, it's 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 the peak nesting. Um, it's probably the best time. I would suggest inside information. Listen very carefully. That um, speak to one of the the operators, but um, don't go when the weather is bad. So the the better the weather. I mean, the leatherbacks will come out, but loggerheads don't like to come out in really foul weather, especially if the wind's howling all day. And um, if it if it's rain or drizzle, then they will come out very early evening because they uh, they don't tend to nest because they scared that the nest will collapse um, if it rains and it runs down the shell, and um, especially if it's been if it's rained for a few days, then they tend to turn around because it's very hard to dig through the through the um, sand. So the better the weather, the better the chances. Okay. <laughs> Great. Anyway. Um, I wanted to ask a question quickly. It might be a silly question, um, but hmm. initially, if it's if it's difficult to determine the sex of the turtle, like initial studies, was it done in the laboratory or is it in how did they determine initially that the temperature affects the sex of the turtle? It's it's actually quite interesting when you talk to the gurus that have been um, working with turtles for a long time. I remember talking to Colin Limpus. Um, now he's Mr. Loggerhead, who started many years ago. And I mean, he's as old as our turtles are, or our turtle program. And he remembers <laughs> when it was in the late, uh, early 80s, when um, it was, so we're talking about the 80s. Um, some of the people are like me, or were toddlers or then, or kids. That was when it was first proposed that it could be um, that it could be temperature that's determining, and there was almost a breakup in the academic circles because it was at the time as seen such an outrageous outrageous um, postulation, and it was um, Tamar and Rozovsky that basically did this first work, and they they put it into incubators and started to manipulate. But then the problem is, how do you identify the sex of these individuals? And mm -hmm. initially, we had to kill the hatchlings, take the gonads out, do sectioning, and they're only about as thick, thick as your hair at that stage, and then work out whether it is a male or a female. So once you know what the individual was, it can no longer reproduce because you have to sacrifice the, the individual. And there's been all sorts of other methods, and it's only two years ago, where they have found a marker, which is a, the marker that seems to be inducing the production of the male um, reproductive organs. And within the first few uh, weeks, using a blood sample and a very expensive laboratory process, those individuals can now be sexed accurately but, uh, and survive. So just a drop of blood can tell us that, but it is not, not simple. So most of these studies that says all beaches are turning female is what we've done like here. It is basically an estimate because you either sacrifice the individuals or um, up until now, there was no other better way of sexing the individuals. Okay. Interesting. Um, I know Ruan makes his appearance when it's time to close because it's half past eight. But I just just I do want to make one comment. Can I, <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay. Go for it. Okay, just two more. Um, so you spoke about the female coming back six times to shore. Is that per season or is that in a lifetime? Oh no, within that season. So loggerheads That's will right. nest four to five times. A leatherback can nest up to ten times in a season. Mm -hmm. Each time laying a bucket of eggs so it's a huge amount of energy green turtles and, will do about six clutches and then is she strategic in it like um does she try and ratio the sex ratio out no not not in terms of sex ratio 
now you're getting into some some seriously cool stuff. But um, what's interesting is they can target where the um, not only to the same nesting beach, but to the same part of a nesting beach, and they can get it accurate to within a few hundred meters in South Africa. And we've got 180 kilometer beach. Some beaches are much smaller, and they can be even more specific than that. And they basically come back to the same piece of beach. But then every year we get these events of turtles, turtle nests that's spread around the coast all the way to Cape Town. And that's yeah. where the, um, these are the vagrant nests, but this is also where the variability is. And those can be um, successful. And that is basically how they preempt what the climate is going to be. Do. Now, whether it's really, I mean, it's an interesting question that one of my students are looking at. It, you can't say that it is a conscious behavior, but it is sort of a, um, a strategy, not, <laughs> not intentional strategy that is um, perpetuating the, the populations. Hedging yeah. bets. Wow. Sure. Yeah, oh. wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, last question. I just want to know the, um, the fossil. Where was it found? Like, is it under oh, there are many, I don't many know anything fossils. about that. It's so not just one the fossil. They are. Um, it's mostly in um, some of those are from Texas. The Arche um, Archelon, I'm not entirely sure. Um, that is the very big turtle skeleton, but um, there are many of the fossil beds in, in the southern US. And I think it is because mm -hmm. it was the sort of large old ancient seas. Um, but it's more than one place, different species, including terrapins, and because sea turtles are descendants of terrapins and what we would find in lakes and rivers and estuaries. And there are species that are now sort of terrapins that venture into the ocean on occasion. Mm -hmm. So we can say, oh, is that the eighth species of sea turtle in the making? So it's not it's not stagnant. It's, it's moving all the time. I just want to do before one closes. Up, one last comment. Um, one of the reasons. So when we do those nest monitoring, we catch um, the hatchlings. Not to uh, and we do take a, bi a biopsy punch, a DNA punch of them. Most because it's the only way that we can get any information about fathers. Isn't because. Uh, turtle males never come ashore. It's only females that come ashore. So we know nothing about um, turtle males, essentially. But if you know who the mom is, and we sample all of the hatchlings or is a representative component of the hatchlings in the nest, we can work out how many dads they were. And if we can work out many clutches, we will know how many dads there are in a population relative to the mom. Oh, that's and great. That, that's... Um, Genetic work is currently ongoing. I've got a PhD student and a master's student that looking, and it's everything else that that we can learn from it. Huge amount of governing um, in terms of behavior, whether they go north, south, east, west. It's all probably in the genes. That's brilliant. Before we uh, just one, literally one last question from the audience because I think it's an important one from Adrian Westhuizen again. Um, if it does come to a point where not enough females are born, can you take a set number of eggs out and put the eggs in an incubator to ensure that they are females? Um, yes. Um, normally it's the other way around, or particularly with climate change, we've got the problem of too many females being born. But the, but the question is, the, the principle is the same. There are many examples of sea turtle hatcheries in the world. None of them good examples. Um, and hatcheries in a conservation context, including fish, are actually frowned upon. So, yes, if we simply count numbers, then it could be good. Or if we then look at six, then it may be good. <clears throat> but we, if we really look at whether those are vigorous, individuals that should have survived um, then we start to actually interfere with the genetic makeup of the population so hatcheries and moving eggs is an absolute last resort that we will not consider for a long long time in this country thank you very much Mori. 
you can end off the evening. <laughs> uh, cool. So, I mean, I think it's linked to the hatcheries thing. I mean, uh, there have been lots of, you know, suggestions. Go and gather all of those babies and keep them in, a, in an aquarium for the first, however the long vulnerable period is to <coughs> stop them getting eaten by birds and crabs and other things on the beach. At least then they get into the water. And I would have thought, you know, if the main diet is... Um, jellyfish it's not a thing that's that difficult to you know keep alive to keep them alive is that actually like a, a viable option I, I i got what you said about the eggs so moving the eggs i think is really difficult but once they're actually little hatchlings you literally collect i mean 80 percent of them and, and and put them in an aquarium is that a viable thing to do or <clears throat> oh um simply because of scale so remember the graph that we looked at one female having a very high reproductive output and it takes a really long time so the scale at which you have to do this i mean you can ask any of the aquarium folk here to look after a turtle for a very short time is really expensive because these things do not like to eat um, there was a story of where they wanted to feed them in the early days on cactus leaves uh, uh, and these things eat prawn and crayfish and very expensive food. So this is this is not a cheap hobby. Yeah. And if you take it by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individuals to the scale that it would would be necessary only to feed fish on a reef, because they're still going to be eaten with a very small proportion that make it eventually. It's not the best way to spend money. Oh, well, thanks. Sure. Lovely. Mori, thank you uh, for ending up yeah. our session. Aisha, thank you very much for handing the questions and answers. And then again, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Nall and everyone uh, of your team and your students and everyone from all the aquaria, the, both the aquaria from South Africa, with absolutely incredible work you're doing. Um, let's give a last round of applause to Professor Nall, and then we will end off the evening. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. And to everyone. <laughs>